Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this webinar, which is being hosted by H AHDB Beef and Lamb. My name is Liz Ford, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Manager for Beef and Lamb within AHDB. I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar on optimizing fodder beet in livestock systems. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Jim Gibbs from Lincoln University, New Zealand. Jim is not only a fodder beet grazing specialist, but also a vet and a ruminant nutritionist specialist. Jim has done extensive work over the last 10 years, optimizing the utilization of fodder beet in beef, sheep and dairy systems. The plan of action is that Jim will run through a 40 minute presentation and then there will be time for some questions at the end. You will all stay muted throughout the, the webinar, but if anyone would like to ask a question, then please type your question into the box on the side of your screens. If you can't see this box, you might have to click the orange arrow to open it up. I will then ask Jim our questions once he's finished presenting. Hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties tonight, but please do bear with us if there are any. So I'll now hand over to Jim. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> oh, good evening, Liz. Um, thank you for that introduction and uh, good evening to the uh, listeners out there to this webinar this evening. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and share this information. So uh, as has been introduced already, I'm going to run through the development of fodder beet grazing systems in New Zealand, and then we'll look specifically at, in order, uh, three systems, the applications in the dairy industry, the applications in beef finishing industry in particular, and then uh, where fodder beet is being used in uh, various sheep systems in New Zealand. And we'll leave plenty of time for questions. So uh, to start with, um, there's an important story behind the use of fodder beet and uh, specifically the grazing of fodder beet. And that gives uh, a, a very good background to understand some of the important um, positives and negatives about fodder beet use and also some of the limitations as well. So we'll begin with that and then we'll move through the specific systems after. So for those of you who aren't familiar with fodder beet, and I imagine um, many in the audience are familiar with it because it's a crop that has been around and been used in various applications in the UK for many years. Uh, what you see on the screen is uh, a mature fodder beet crop at the end of its growing cycle. And uh, we would normally say that from little things, big things grow. So the fodder beet starts off small with a lot of leaf and a relatively small bulb and ends up with a, a potentially very large bulb and that bulb size and the contents of the dry matter contents of that bulb in particular are what drive the very high yields in it. Now to give a little bit of background, um, fodder beet has been used as a stock feed for the best part of 500 years and in the British literature in particular you can go back several hundred years and find specific mentions of it and that was carried to Australia and New Zealand uh, by the, the British and the uh, British settlers and an understanding of the use of fodder beet has been there since um, before 1900. So there's good records in both Australia and New Zealand about fodder beet being grown and used. But there was always uh, a very specific limitation to it, that there was a strong European idea that there was something that was inherently toxic uh, with fodder beet. In the very early years, it was unknown, but in the last sort of 50 or 60 years, it was commonly suggested that because this particular plant family holds quite a lot of oxalic acid, that the content of this acid uh, meant that it was inherently toxic and that there was a limitation to the amount that could be fed at any one time. So historically, the use was limited. In fact, some of the very early um, science papers around this would describe, and, and I quote, what the killing dose of fodder beet was. And it was usually limited to a couple of kilograms of dry matter uh, per day. And clearly that made it a very difficult crop to use. So effectively it was used as a supplement to other feeding. Now, the next component of this story and where fodder beet grazing uh, really began in New Zealand is because the New Zealand dairy industry in particular uh, is almost 100% spring calving and the, dry, the cows are dried off at the end of autumn and through the winter period, they're grazed out. In the South Island in particular, the climate's cold enough that there's not a lot of uh, grass growth. So historically, uh, winter crops of various types were really common and nearly all the uh, South Island dairy industry would use them. Now, 
those crops were uh, within the last 25 or 30 years in particular were almost exclusively brassica crops uh, in the in the southern areas they were swedes and in the more northern areas they were commonly kale and both kale and um, swedes have various agronomic and animal health difficulties they're also variable yields and for a number of reasons, um, there was a strong interest in the dairy industry itself and specifically in some progressive farmers in trying to find an alternative. <laughs> there were also some European uh, European farmers who'd emigrated to New Zealand who were farming there and, and among them, some of them had imported their own very small amounts of fodder bead and were growing it, so it was seen by the industry. Now, the, the way that it was used was um, consistent with the way that it had been historically used as a, uh, rather than strip grazed, as was very common in the New Zealand dairy industry, it was used by being picked and then um, fed back to the cattle at relatively small amounts. Well, there were some Kiwi farmers who uh, looked at this, they liked the idea of these very large yields, and so they began to do what they'd done with other crops, which was strip graze them. <clears throat> and there were uh, very great difficulties with this. There was a, a lot of animal health issues and again the, the common thought around it was that there was a toxicity involved in this. So in uh, in the 2008 uh, season uh, I became involved in this and through the National Dairy uh, Research Levy funds I was funded to um, to look at some of these issues with um, fodder bean and particularly the, uh, the animal health uh, issues around them. At that stage in New Zealand, there was approximately 50 hectares or so. There was very little there. And uh, through that program over the next few years, we determined that the principal issue was nothing to do with the toxicity and nothing to do with oxalic acid really in any way, shape or form. But it was uh, an uncomplicated issue around rumen acidosis and being exposed to the really large amounts of sugar that the crop um, contains uh, too quickly and through that work we uh, developed a transition protocol that meant that the animals were transitioned over a period of 14 days and we published that transition protocol and from that point the uh, the hectares uh, in New Zealand began to climb so over the next 10 years or so it went from uh, approximately 50 hectares to about 70,000 hectares in that period and there was a large body of research that we had conducted along the way and we'll talk about um, most of those components. One thing that's interesting and important to remember is that it began in uh, dry cows being wintered and the extension after that was to move into lactation feeding which was very early on in the development of this and then subsequently into sheep and beef systems and we'll talk about them in those order. So a couple of basics around the crop that are worth remembering. Uh, the first one is that it has around the highest ME of any of the forage crops that we uh, have available to us. It has a very consistent ME of around 12 and over the life of that plant it doesn't alter. So uh, we can get something to in the vicinity of 300 days and that ME doesn't go down. With the senescence of the plant towards the end there's a, a very sudden shift uh, right at the point where it becomes reproductive but prior to that from in our case from spring sowing from autumn right through winter and into spring it's a very consistent ME and the second component that comes into play with this is that it's a very high yield so the uh, the largest yields in New Zealand at the moment are up to 43 tonnes of dry matter per hectare which is a, uh, a long way ahead of any of the alternative forages and as a consequence of that and that alone uh, it's a spectacularly cheap feed uh, based both on a kilogram of dry matter basis but also expressed in um, megajoules of metabolizable energy. Now we'll spend just a moment talking um, specifically about some of the attributes of the plant and the first one is that there are different cultivars that are used and they're in the ground at different levels. So uh, the cultivar that you can see there with the red line on that screen that shows the, um, the amount of that plant that's uh, under the ground and the amount of plant that's above the ground. Now this varies and as a general rule of thumb the higher the dry matter is the more that the plant will grow down into the ground. So with the dry matters that are available for grazing, 
the overwhelming bulk of them will have particularly good utilisation with cattle. With sheep it changes a little and we'll talk about that later, but particularly with cattle the utilisation is very strong. In fact, tested many times in various weather events and systems over many years, we've not measured the utilisation under 95%. So they eat all of this plant. They eat the leaf and they eat the bulb and they eat the portion of the bulb that's in the soil as well. The second component that's something that we'll get to uh, when we're talking in various systems for different reasons is that there's a, a large disparity in this plant between the leaf and the bulb. Now in agronomically positive crops, the one that you can see in front of you there, the leaf component will be approximately 20 to 25 percent of the total dry matter of the plant. The remainder will be the bulb. Now that leaf will contain um, disproportionately much of the protein of the whole plant and it'll also contain particularly the calcium and phosphorus. Uh, whereas in the bulb, it has a, tends to have a relatively low crude protein that can be down as low as 6%, can be up as high as 13%, but it's certainly lower than the leaf and it's uh, effectively a, an energy bomb. So it will commonly be 50% sucrose or 50% uh, water soluble carbohydrates. The other component that's important to remember is that with the lower dry matter varieties it's common to have dry matters as low as 15% and uh, down to 10% so when consuming this plant the animals are eating a lot of water and that's an important component in understanding some of the systems which we'll return to later. I'll put this up as a uh, as a brief demonstration, but what I'd like to draw the uh, the listeners' attention to is you can see the discrepancy in the neutral detergent fiber, the protein, the calcium and phosphorus between the leaf and the bulb. So particularly with the protein and the calcium, you can see that there's a very large difference between the content of the leaf and the content of the bulb. Now what that means practically is that uh, the feeding management has to be uh, has to be very careful in terms of matching the leaf and the bulb consumption and that's something that we'll return to with uh, both beef and sheep in particular. So as a summary with that because it's a very high yielding crop it tends to be a low cost because it's a high uh, ME uh, content it's a very cheap form of energy in fact it's been described in New Zealand as the grain that New Zealand never had and it's uh, far cheaper than nearly all of the available um, supplementary feeds. So on a cost return basis, for example, most grass silage in the South Island of New Zealand is costed out at around about 35 New Zealand cents per kilogram of dry matter. So with most farmers growing beet at around 10 cents a kilogram dry matter, you can see that there's a significant saving for them. And in addition to that, the energy content, of course, is much higher. In most cases at uh, deeper latitudes in particular it'll be sown in spring but that isn't always true in the uh, in some of the higher latitudes it can be sown in autumn and in some places it can be sown almost year round. And the final point that I'll put here is we're going to speak mostly about grazed beet but there is some harvesting of beet that goes on. Now some of that the listeners will be familiar with, and that's just the conventional harvesting which is equivalent to the sugar beet crop use where the leaf is flailed off and then the beets are picked up and stored. In, again to use um, an example in New Zealand against the cost of the beet grown, um, it's approximately five cents a kilogram dry matter to do that commercially if you take into account the proportion of dry matter that you lose. Now the other alternative which is a New Zealand innovation is to use a beet bucket. Now the beet bucket is a very simple bucket and that um, is an apparatus that goes on the front of the tractor and has uh, a bar that bounces the beet out of the ground. Now in that case it's a, a very cheap way to do it, it's approximately one cent a kilogram dry matter and it means that you keep the leaf. So most of the, the lifting of beet that's done is done through the beet bucket in New Zealand rather than through harvested beet. Now typically the way that that would be done is that it would be picked up with the beet bucket and put into a conventional silage wagon and then it would be fed out on pasture and we'll return to that with lactation feeding and feeding in sheep systems later on. So now we'll talk about the um, initial application of this and the way that it's used is uh, dry cow uh, winter grazing. Now in the southern hemisphere, um, in New Zealand, the South Island, most of the cattle are dried off at the end of May 
and they'll carve again somewhere from the end of July through to the end of August broadly. Now in that interim period they're put onto a crop and the expectation is that there'll be a crop that's um, both safe and has a reasonable body condition score gain over that period. So the way that the beet is used as you can see in the picture there is that they're transitioned onto this and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the transition program uh, later, but they're transitioned onto it and they're transitioned up until they're on unrestricted feeding and that's very important. They're not they're not technically transitioned onto that crop until they're eating as much as they can and uh, that will be approximately 2.2% of their live weight. So for uh, 500 or 550 kilo uh, winter weight that's somewhere between 11 and 12 kilograms of dry matter. In addition to that they have a very limited amount of supplement and that supplement most of the time is two kilograms of dry matter eaten. Now the protein content of that is not important, it's providing a, a, a roughage source and a fibre source. Now the total cost of that winter diet in, uh, in New Zealand currency is a, just under 12 cents a kilogram dry matter which makes it a very cheap winter diet. Now the high ME means that they get very strong body condition gains so it's quite common to have body condition score gains on our system of 0 to 10 of 0 0.5 to 1 body condition in the winter period and that will be the minimum approximately 60 days and the maximum uh, a little bit over 80 days. In addition to that because it's a very high yielding crop it tends to be a really high stocking rate and uh, it's it's approximately um, in, the, in the vicinity of 25 to 40 cows per hectare for a full 60 or 70 day winter and as we said before the utilisation is very high. So the advantages around it are that it's the cheapest winter feed, it's a very simple one to use, um, there's a very high body condition score gain and because of the high yields it means that the amount of land that's um, in use each time is reduced and it's an all-weather feed. It can be fed well in wet weather, it can be fed well in snow, um, there's really no conditions where it can't be safely and easily fed. The, the other advantage in that uh, winter feeding and it is extended now into lactation feeding which we'll go on to speak about after this and that is that it can be uh, used in autumn and then in spring. So there's a continuity between their autumn uh, approach to supplementation using fodder beet, their winter feeding of fodder beet and also a spring feeding of fodder beet in lactation to follow that. There's a few things that we probably should discuss at least uh, in passing and perhaps some, some of the listeners will have some questions that we can talk about in more detail before it. And the main one to, uh, to put very clearly here is that all of the research over almost 15 years now was around the rumen function and specifically the difficulties with acidosis. So I'd like to be very clear on this, if they're transitioned appropriately to an unlimited feed, so ad libitum feeding, they're feeding as much of that beet as they can with the minimum amount of supplement, their rumen pH is not low, they don't have acidosis nor are they at risk of acidosis, to the contrary their rumen pH is relatively high. So uh, still occasionally there's, um, there's some talk that they're at risk of acidosis or they have subclinical acidosis, this is completely untrue. The, the rumen pH in these well transitioned cows at ad libitum feeding is extremely high, not low. The second component that you hear which is sometimes associated with this is that there's a requirement for a very high supplement input and by supplement we, we mean a roughage input and this is not true. All of the early work and all of the early research we did was looking specifically at this to try and titrate carefully what was the required supplement for normal rumen function and the required supplement is approximately two kilos fed of a roughage source. <clears throat> now I'll, I'll mention in passing these others but you hear occasionally particularly in the northern hemisphere that there's some concerns over the soil intake which is another area of the primary research that we did in the early years there are, there are no negatives around the soil intake that's uh, associated with fodder beet that we've found, not in trace element supply, not in uh, gastrointestinal tissue damage and in no other area of nutrition is there any difficulty with the amount of soil that they have. Overfat cows are a particular concern, uh, one of the difficulties with longer wintering periods is that the body condition gain is very high and it has to be managed quite carefully. 
uh, there have been some instances where uh, they're arriving at uh, the data carving in uh, they're over conditioned and of course there's a significant series of metabolic uh, problems if that's true uh, particularly around milk fever and and on occasion around uh, post calving ketosis and then the final one that i'll mention in passing is that uh, beet is a crop that uses a lot of potassium but it's not a crop that holds a lot of potassium in its tissue uh, on occasion, it's been uh, spoken about as a high potassium crop that presents a dietary cation anion uh, difference issue, but that's not the case. The, the potassium use is high because it's a really high yielding crop, not because it holds a lot of potassium uh, in that tissue. So we'll move to lactation feeding uh, now and to put it simply, the lactation feeding was an extension of the winter crop feeding, and originally that was in spring because there was there was uh, excess crop. On the New Zealand systems, uh, they are primarily pasture based and often nothing but pasture and uh, grass silage. And in those situations, what we have determined and worked with for many years is that you can feed one third of the diet and a common spring diet will be something in the vicinity of 16 to 18 kilograms of dry matter maximum intake. And you can feed one third of that diet, you can feed one third of that diet uh, without any difficulty at all in beet. So there, well, by no difficulty, what I mean is that there's no requirement for um, specific supplementation of protein or fiber or calcium or phosphorus. If the rest of the diet, two thirds of the diet is a, is a typical pasture based diet and we're not, we're not talking about diets that contain a lot of starch or um, uh, some, some other concentrates that have been put into them, but a typical pasture based diet, then that one third is a very handy rule. So it's quite common to have five kilograms of dry matter fed out uh, both shoulders. That would be the autumn shoulder and also the spring shoulder. And the driver for this was cost. Um, in most cases in New Zealand, the cost of grain uh, is above $350 a tonne. So put, putting that in real terms, it's it's quite common for it to be above 40 cents a kilogram dry matter. And most of the time the beet can be supplied on platform, uh, either in beet bucket harvested form or in a grazed form, which is the most common one, for around 10 cents with an additional less than five cents involved in harvesting it. So there's a very, on an energy basis supplied, there's a very strong differential in that price. Now the advantages, uh, the advantages of lactation feeding are pretty straightforward, but there's two in particular. It's a relatively low crude protein crop. So the total crude protein of most well-grown, agronomically well-managed crops is approximately 13%. Now, most of the time in both autumn and spring in pasture-based systems, there tends to be a relatively high crude protein. So the supply of uh, a, a large, amount of fermentable carbohydrates with a relatively low protein matches the pasture well. The, the driver of course is on an energy basis, buying it on uh, per ME or megajoule of ME. It's a very low cost system and it's a lower, much lower cost than any of the alternatives. Wherever possible, that's used as a grazed beet. So um, the, the preference is not to have uh, tractors and machinery involved wherever it's possible. And that can be simply done in most lactation systems. So five kilos of dry matter is approximately two hours worth of grazing a day. So those paddocks can be situated close enough to the shed that they could be used on the way into the shed or on the way back to the shed in a pasture-based system. And that's very commonly done. Um, the utilization is usually very good and uh, that's grazing utilization is usually very good and that's pretty much independent of the weather however in some situations with larger herds or where it's difficult to have that grazing next to the shed or close to it to avoid long walking distance then beet bucket or commercial harvesting is used and in those situations it's put into a silage wagon and the beet is taken onto the pasture for the cows rather than the cows being walked in to be grazed on them and then a final one, which I won't say too much about, but uh, an area of research in the last couple of years has been effectively using the uh, effluent irrigation as a way of replacing the fertilizer cost in growing large crops of beet. And if that's done on platform, uh, a smallish area growing a very large yield, that's um, 
that's part of the normal rotational grazing program every day means that those nutrients are effectively harvested from that area, mined if you like, and then distributed across the rest of the farm. So there's quite a sophisticated system of using that effluent and then uh, pushing that potassium and uh, to a lesser extent that nitrogen across the rest of the farm by using that grazing in a rotational system. I'll just mention a couple of the myths that um, you hear a little bit about in lactation. The first one goes back to the idea that there was a significant oxalic acid content and uh, this sometimes is still brought up that you, uh, there's something that's inherent in the beet that causes an increase in the somatic cell count or is, is, is associated with an increase in the incidence of mastitis in the herd. Um, this isn't true in terms of oxalic acid or any component of the plant, but one issue that has to be reasonably well managed is in the autumn and spring seasons when beet is commonly used on the shoulders, when there's not enough pasture base to, to go around, they tend to be higher rainfall times. And if you're not careful with your paddock selection and the way that the animals are managed in that paddock, there tends to be a lot of splash. So there's more uh, mud and there's more uh, slurry. And in some cases, this has resulted in higher mastitis. So it's something that needs to be managed carefully, but in itself, it's not a cause of mastitis. Um, typically, there's a positive milk solid response because there's good energy. And on top of that, very high fermentable carbohydrate drives propionic acid. So we, we typically have uh, very positive milk proteins with it as well. The phosphorus and calcium in most platform pasture is well in excess of the requirements when it's two thirds of the diet. So we don't see any change in that. And there's no specific use of that in response to them being lactation fed beet at the time and then there's no impact on reproduction. So in conclusion, with regards to the dairy, um, farmers uh, understood very quickly what the value of this was and, and effectively was the grain that New Zealand didn't have. And it was a much cheaper source of grain. It was a lot easier to feed out in most cases and it was very high utilisation in all weather and a very straightforward way of supplying it. So between the two of them, the rise in hectares in a short period of time was really strong. Now we'll leave the lactation or we'll leave the dairy systems with both uh, wintering and lactation now and talk specifically about the rise in uh, beef systems and we'll talk two of these. Um, one of them is the use of weaners taken through for accelerated finishing and slaughter at about 14 or 16 months old and then the second one is just conventional finishing of, uh, of older framed animals uh, in what amounts to a green feedlot or the equivalent of a green feedlot. So just one point about um, New Zealand beef, which is something that is my understanding from talking to a number of UK farmers is, is something that's shared here as well, that uh, the beef industry in New Zealand has been under some pressure for a number of years. Um, the picture that you can see on the screen in front of you is what a lot of people imagine when they think of New Zealand. And there's a lot of really positive provenance issues in terms of selling New Zealand beef overseas. Um, green grass, blue sky, uh, outdoors, etc. There's some real positives around it. But the fact is the New Zealand industry, beef industry has been under some pressure for quite a long time. And uh, up until several years ago, the, the price for wiener calves had not moved much in 15 years. And the beef cow numbers as a response to that really had been dropping. And the principal reason for that is in a pasture based system, you have ups and downs and your seasonal response to this means that uh, the average age, 90% plus of the beef steers that were slaughtered in New Zealand was between 26 and 36 months old. Now that represents a lot of challenges on farm because that's a relatively low stocking rate, a low productivity. <clears throat> and it also represents a, a bit of a challenge for the meat processes because it means that there's a tremendous amount of variability in the beef that's put in front of the consumer. And this is why. It might be green in spring and it might be green in autumn, but it can be very dry in summer and it can be reasonably cold in winter. And they're the challenges, uh, as particularly in the southern parts of New Zealand that the beef industry has to deal with. And fodder beet in particular was a, a grand solution to this and to a number of those issues that we've just spoken about, both in terms of shortening the interval to slaughter and having a more consistent product and having a very cost effective way of supplying energy in the off season. So we'll talk about two different systems which 
will be rising one-year-old or the weaner finishing systems and then the rising two-year-old or the older animal finishing systems and we'll talk about them uh, in series. So the first one we'll talk about is the use of weaners. Uh, one point to note here that is slightly different from the UK, in the New Zealand system, almost all of the beef animals are spring-born. So uh, typically they'll be spring-born, they'll have a reasonable spring on the cow, they'll do okay through that summer while they're on the cow, but from weaning in the autumn at six months old, through that first winter, they'll normally do reasonably poorly. They'll have another good spring where they put on quite a lot of live weight, slow that down in summer, sink into another winter, have another good spring, and hence they take that period to 26 months before they're um, before they're, they're actually ready for slaughter. So in this system, what we did was we utilized the really high ME uh, of beet and the very simple grazing systems that were available with it. And we would use these six months old in this method. We would look at an entry weight of above 250 kilograms of live weight. And this would be in autumn at approximately six months old. We would take them and after they were weaned, we'd have an interval where they were on good quality grass for a period to adapt their room into higher uh, energy intakes. And then we would transition them onto fodder beet and we would hold them on that fodder beet for 130 or 150 days. That would be from somewhere in uh, mid autumn right through until the, and this is an important point, until the grass was growing strongly in spring. And then we would release them from that system and we put them onto spring grass. Now, our average live weight gain, if we're 250 kilograms or above and they're managed appropriately at that time with appropriate cultivars and management while they're grazing on beet, uh, is one kilogram of live weight gain a day over that period of 150 days. So that means when they come into spring that they're approximately 400 kilograms and then they go out onto the spring grass when they're well framed up. Their live, their live weight gain uh, always increases uh, when they go onto that spring grass and typically wherever you are in New Zealand you get 90 days, at least 90 days of good spring grass. So if we look at an average live weight gain of about 1.5 kilograms a day over that period, that means that by the end of that uh, spring 90 day period, we're at approximately 530 kilograms live weight or above. Now the uh, killing out percentage on beet is different to pasture. So typically for our pasture based steers, our uh, carcass to live weight percentage is about 52%. On beet for the British breeds, for Angus and Herefords, it's 54 to 56%. And for the continental and later maturing breeds like Charolais, Simital, etc., it's 56 to 58%. So what that means is for a relatively low alive weight, we can still get a 300 kilo carcass weight, which is often our target. Now, one of the real advantages of this system is that the stocking rate is a little bit under one per tonne of dry matter grown for that whole 150 days. So what that practically means is for a very conservative figure of 20 tonnes, your stocking rate will be above 20 to the hectare for that period. So that means that not only are they putting on more weight, as traditionally they didn't put on weight in autumn and winter, particularly on the brassicas where um, there was a, a lot of research done for many years looking at live weight gains on brassicas and they're almost always very poor. So on grass too, it was difficult to have enough grass and with utilisation, et cetera, it's quite difficult to have live weight gains in a productive system there. In this system, we could take them off those pastures in autumn. So we were sparing the pastures for other use. We could keep solid live weight gains so they were framed up for spring. We could utilise all of the spring grass that we had and then have them slaughtered before the grass started disappearing in the warmer summers. If it's a 20, uh, 20 to the hectare stocking rate on the fodder beet over that period and something above seven to a hectare for our spring grass. And usually to achieve that figure, we're looking at an average spring growth of 60 kilograms of dry matter per hectare uh, a day. Then our total stocking rate in that system is above 10 per hectare. So that means on an annualized basis, every year we're turning off 3000 kilograms of carcass weight per hectare a year. So this was an extremely efficient system that meant that we had these animals for a much shorter period of time and it was a very profitable and productive system. Now the second system that we'll talk about is the, um, is the finishing of older steers. Now in this case, uh, again reminding you that they're nearly all spring born, so they'd be at least 18 months old and in that next autumn 
and for the steers somewhere at a weight of 440 kilograms or above live weight now these are reasonably cheap purchases most of the time because uh, at that time in autumn people are selling them before they have to winter them so it's a good time of year to be buying them on a live weight basis in New Zealand and what would happen with these is that different to the young stock they'd come in a little bit later in autumn they'd come straight onto the crop and they'd be held onto the crop for approximately 100 days and they're larger they're framed up they were uh, transitioned onto maximum photobate, in photobate intakes with uh, minimal supplements so they'd often be two kilograms or less of supplement per animal per day and the live weight gains in these are very strong um, the the average budgeted live weight gain is somewhere between 1.3 to 1.5 kilograms a day now what that means is that we're slightly higher in the live weight than what we are in the younger system so again we're looking at a target carcass weight of about 300 uh, kilograms and at stocking rates for these there's no grass used beyond that so they're slaughtered directly off the crop so they're brought onto the crop they're transitioned onto it they're onto the maximum gains and then they're slaughtered directly off the crop and the value of that in the New Zealand system is that there's a premium in the schedule that's paid in the late winter and early spring uh, it's a very high value carcass it has a high fat content and it has extensive marbling so it's um, the the hit rate into the the number one carcass grade for beet fed beef is approximately 80 percent and the hit rate for the standard uh, pasture based systems is closer to 40 percent so it's a it's a very large change again it's a very productive and profitable system there's a little bit to be said around some variations on this theme so um, in most cases wherever possible we would do this by strip grazing them through the whole season but in certain cases there's another way uh, around this which is to use bulb that's taken out onto poor pastures so the pasture is the supplement supply in this case and then the bulb can be supplied either beet bucket bulb or on occasion uh, harvested bulb where it's put out at um, what amounts to full intakes for these. Again, about 2.2% of their live weight, which is approximately 10 kilograms, so slightly above 10 kilograms. So there are some variations on that theme. Now, without um, disappearing too deeply into the, the technical side of this, the, the advantages in this system, for both the younger system, but particularly in the older system, it's a very cheap way of supplying energy and it's a very cheap way of supplying energy at a time when we don't typically have it in a pasture-based system. So what that means is that the high yields, again, pull mouths off the rest of the farm. They concentrate them on a relatively small area of the farm, which means that you have control over that and you have uh, better control over whatever winter damage um, you may or may not want with the rest of the farm. But the principal driver for it is that we look very carefully at the cost of gain. And I put some figures up there to give you a demonstration. Now I recognize the figures are different in, um, in different countries and there's different prices for supplements, but you can see the disparity between the, the live weight gain and what you paid for simply on a live weight gain, let alone carcasses, and what we're paying for that feeding and with minimum uh, minimal mechanical inputs on that. So often in these cases, one man can do a thousand to fifteen hundred uh, head a day in terms of feeding, particularly when there's no tractor involved and the supplement being used is some standing pasture or uh, cereal crop. So again, a very profitable system and a really productive system. So with the time remaining to us, we'll talk about the uh, application in sheep systems. So the first thing to say about these is that they're a very different system in, in both the dairy applications and specifically in the beef applications, we were looking principally at uh, promoting live weight gain and all of the benefits of that live weight gain. In sheep systems, the typical benefit is not necessarily that live weight gain, but the ability to take mouths off the rest of the farm and put them in very, very high stocking rates in a place where they can achieve a very high plane of nutrition that suits their system to spare the rest of the farm and to have more grass available in autumn and then in spring. So we'll cover the ewe wintering systems where this began. I'll, I'll make a mention of hogget systems and then particularly lamb systems. We've discussed most of these prior, but the uh, most of these points you can see on the screen um, prior to this, but the one point to point out 
here very clearly is that the stocking rates for sheep on big crops of beet are very high. Um, I've put there an upper limit of 200 a hectare actually on the very high yields it's well above that and on occasion for multiple use it can be heading towards 300 a hectare at the very high end of the crop and that's for extended periods of time across winter. So again what that's doing is it's saving the rest of the farm and it's saving winter damage on the rest of the farm. Um, the positive about this is in agronomically well managed crops that there's a really good ratio of the total crude protein that's required to the positive energy balance for sheep. So on, on occasion I've heard this said that you know the protein's too low or there has to be another protein source that's um, uh, put in to remedy this and that, that simply isn't the case. In agronomically well managed crops where there's 25 or sometimes even more in autumn uh, percent of the total dry matter of the plant in the leaf then the protein supply is perfectly acceptable even for multiples and the energy supply that they can achieve with the intakes for that is well above uh, what their requirement is. The way that this is done in most cases in sheep, very different to cattle, they don't have a uh, transition, they manage their intake very differently so you don't have um, you don't have issues with rumen acidosis by and large, you get the occasional one, but by and large on a flock basis, you don't have that. They transition uh, well themselves. Typically it takes them a couple of weeks to get up to uh, full intakes, but that's not often noticed in, in that uh, early time. And the usual exposure and adaptation to the crop for sheep is that they're run on and off for a couple of hours, for a couple of days, and then they're locked on. Now, in most cases, the um, supplement inputs are lower or non-existent in sheep compared to uh, the beef and dairy that we've spoken about before. So again, um, because the supplements or the roughage inputs typically are much more expensive than the beet, it's an extremely cheap way to hold large numbers off the rest of the farm. Now, they're often put on in autumn and then they're held across there until uh, two or three weeks before lambing and then they're put out for set stocking at that. So uh, it's a long period across um, a challenging uh, winter environment and there's a really good live weight gain and body condition score gain in use even in multiples with these and there's real positives around their animal health. So there's no uh, negatives, there's uh, real positives around the use of this and as a result this has been uh, an area where the hectares have um, increased markedly over the last five or six years. There are some challenges and uh, there's two in particular. Uh, one, unlike cattle, um, sheep have to be managed a little bit more carefully, going back to what we said earlier in the, in the seminar around the proportion of leaf and bulb. Uh, the ewes in particular have to be very carefully managed to make sure that they're always consuming leaf with the bulb. Now we said before that the bulb has very low crude protein, so particularly in multiples, in pregnant ewes and multiples in particular, if that protein, if the leaf's gone and if the animals are eating bulb that doesn't have leaf or doesn't have another source of protein, then they're after three days they're um, their system will hold an amount of nitrogen for approximately three days but after that period it'll fall and when it does fall their intake rapidly goes down. So even though they're surrounded by energy and they can have you know potentially all the uh, high energy feed that they wish, their intakes drop very quickly without that protein source and as a consequence they get twin lamb disease. So there's a, a different discipline around managing sheep than there is in cattle. <clears throat> The second component is that uh, sheep are quite uh, sensitive to the different cultivars. So some cultivars are palatable and some cultivars are not so palatable. And from a farmer point of view, the use of uh, palatable cultivars is really important because what it means is that the sheep will either eat them down into the ground, because unlike cattle they often don't knock them over or pull them out, so they can cone them down into the ground and if they don't like the cultivars they'll leave them out like a rock melon sitting above the ground and pretty much independent of how much pressure you put on them to feed, they won't go back and chew that down. Now that of course is a, a very different utilisation than what we've described in cattle before. The utilisation in those cases can fall to 50%. So they're, they're much more sensitive to the cultivar that's used. On top of that, 
there's a very strong requirement for them to have really good agronomy and to have good quality leaf across that winter period and to be held later into that winter period. So there's some challenges in the use of sheep there that are different to what we would do in cattle. This is an example on the screen in front of you of where the wheels have fallen off. This is a particularly unpalatable cultivar. You can see that uh, most of the bulbs are untouched, so they eat the leaf off and they won't uh, even nibble on most of them. Now that's a, a, an extreme difficulty to get that back. It's a very difficult case to, um, to be dealing with. And the final one I'll mention here is uh, that hoggets and lambs. So hoggets do uh, reasonably well on beet. Again, there's some disciplines around feeding and having agronomically positive crops with good leaf because it, it does become more important, their protein to energy ratio. But when you get down to lambs on them, you can't finish lambs on beet. So uh, the, the protein content of the total plant is just not high enough and, and it's not possible to do that. The way that lambs are used on beet is different. In New Zealand, they're used as the, the beet is used as a holding tank. So these animals can be bought uh, sometimes a month or six weeks earlier in autumn. And remember again, they're all spring born. So in this case, they're going to the lambs that are going to be finished in the the subsequent winter. So they can be bought earlier than they normally would in that autumn for a significant discount on a per animal basis. And they can be held at very high stocking rates on beet, 500 or so to the hectare. And they'll go forward at about 100 grams a day so that they don't have strong growth while they're on the beet because the protein's not high enough, but they are going forward. And it can be used as a very cheap holding feed. And then they're pulled off in, in uh, tranches and then they're finished on uh, other feeds, often on winter ryegrass, etc. So the lamb systems are, are used in a very different way than what we described in uh, beef before. Um, <clears throat> if there's further questions on this, we can talk around um, both joining and lambing on uh, fodder bit crops, both of which we've done, and some of the specific aspects of protein nutrition, but I, I won't address them directly here. So with that, I'll uh, open it up to questions, and I'll just put this as the conclusion. It's a, a novel forage grazing system that's had a, a large amount of research put into it over the last 12 or so years. And the real driver of it is, is that you have such very high dry matter production, which means that it's low cost. And effectively, it's a green feedlot use that's outside. There are a whole series of things that we didn't spend very much time talking on this evening around um, brand new understanding about rumen function characteristics in particular. And to put a finger on them in protein, fiber, and mineral nutrition. There's some uh, very interesting work that's being done by a series of uh, my PhD students in and around this at the moment. And my suggestion is that you'll see a lot more of uh, fodder beet in the UK, particularly over the next few years. And I imagine within the next short while, there'll be a very large amount of hectareage used in the UK and Europe and in various other countries on what we've described tonight. So with that, Liz, I'll turn it back over to you for questions. Brilliant. That's great, Jim. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation and a lot to get through in such a short space of time, really. Um, just while people are, are typing in their questions, I'd just like to remind everyone that the presentation has been recorded and it will be available to watch back on the AHDB YouTube channel. Um, I'd also like to highlight that Jim will be speaking at our Fodder Beat event in Devon on Friday. And if you haven't registered your place already and it's an event you want to go to, then details are all on the website. So please do have a look at that. Um, so we do have a few questions in. So I will kick off with the first one. And that is what crop protection and fertilization plan would you recommend? Um, can I just clarify, I don't know if we can with those questions, but by crop protection, I suspect that they mean the use of pesticides or herbicides. Yep. Was that yeah, fungicides? That was it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, the, the first thing I'd say with that is, um, is maybe to take one step back on it. Fodder beet is a crop that you can grow really large amounts of, and it's very important for most of the applications that people use it, that agronomically it's grown in a, in a responsible manner. It's not a crop as a general rule of thumb that most people can grow themselves. So even in New Zealand, the people who've been using it for heading towards 15 years, and we have some very large operations using it now, these are hundreds of hectares of fodder beet, 3,000, 4,000 trade steers a year coming in and using it. None of those people would grow it themselves. All of them would involve a professional agronomist in making sure that they got what they needed. 
So <clears throat> I'll maybe restrict myself to some of the shifts in fertilizer, which are the more important ones, because I'll bump the questions on agronomy in particular, which is a complicated area and would take quite a while around what you've called crop protection over to, um, to, to a series of agronomists who have some strong experience in this, particularly exposure to New Zealand experience in recent times. But there is one thing with the fertilizer that's worth um, worth mentioning. Uh, most of the agronomy for fodder beet that people are used to is inherited from sugar beet agronomy. And it's worth just mentioning for a moment that the key performance indicators for really good sugar beet crops are very different for what they are for grazing fodder beet crops. So for example, the, the performance indicator for sugar beet crops is to maximise the sucrose per hectare. Now that will typically mean that they're limiting the nitrogen, that they're not looking for the highest dry matter content that they can, or dry matter weight, I should say, that they have for the hectare, that they're not looking for a high leaf proportion, particularly late into the season because it's in their way and it doesn't help them. And yet they're all the things that we are looking for. So some of the shifts in agronomy in New Zealand in the last couple of years that have become very important is that we've changed in particular our nitrogen use and the timing and application of nitrogen. So it's quite common to have four applications of nitrogen and to use more than twice the nitrogen that's being used here. And the principal reason for that is that using more nitrogen increases the proportion of leaf material in the total plant and it holds very good quality leaf into the late autumn and into the colder winter weather, even in cases where that's snow and very heavy frosts. So there's a cryoprotective effect of having good nitrogen in that. Um, the second component, which I'll say very little about, is that um, we have been shifting away from the use of traditional rows. <clears throat> you need the rows to harvest the sugar beet. You certainly don't need them to graze them. And then there's real lifts in productivity and dry matter production if you're uh, moving to higher plant populations by having narrower rows. So, for example, in recent years in the South Island, we've moved from 500 mil rows to 375 mil rows an increase in plant numbers up to 115 or so thousand on a different spacing and it was an immediate 30% increase in yields. So there's some there's some real shifts and there's some new agronomy that's um, that's being nosed out there now that people will see more of in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, and the next question, what minerals should be fed um, to, to beef cattle <coughs> on beet? <clears throat> the, the two trace elements that are most important are selenium and copper. Um, they're for different reasons. Beet typically doesn't have a lot of selenium, so if, especially if you're in areas that are relatively selenium deficient, it's highly likely that you're going to run into some selenium difficulties because you've got a lot of water flushing through that system, so there's a lot of selenium losses. Um, the bioavailability of selenium from the plant is a little lower in those circumstances. <clears throat> and the second one is with copper. And copper, uh, some of the difficulties around copper availability are to do with the amount of soil that is eaten. So for example, if your soils are strong in molybdenum, you'll typically have a lot more copper challenges because in the presence of molybdenum and sulfur, you get copper forming a precipitate that r remains almost completely unavailable. So in circumstances where you have relatively modest copper levels and high molybdenum levels, with an increase in soil intake, you have to make sure that there's copper supplementation done. Many times this will be done in the form of um, boluses. So they'll be using the copper oxide needles, for example, and <clears throat> often with selenium, it's the long acting injections that we use in New Zealand. Just one important note on that, if they're on high intake of beet, uh, they don't drink at all. They're, they're, they're wildly overhydrated, two or three times overhydrated, and they don't drink at all. So it's completely ineffective to be putting anything in the water. And the use of mineral blocks, um, by and large, is not effective. There's excellent research over many years showing even if animals were um, acutely deficient in these minerals, then at the best, you'll only ever get 80% of the animals who will approach a point source mineral uh, supplementation, so something like a lick or a, a loose crumble or something, in most cases it's down to 50%. So it's a particularly ineffective way to do it in beef where you need every animal to be forming at its best. My suggestion is that you supply them directly. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, how important is it to chop the beet in a feedlot system? 
not not at all. Um, we we don't chop beet uh, except for young animals when we're first introducing to them. If they're slow and it's not a particularly palatable cultivar, we don't chop the beet at all. Uh, in a feedlot system where it's being fed to dairy cows and it's uh, in a bunk, the chopping usually is an advantage to you simply because if it's held whole, then they'll pick it up and they'll put it on the ground or it'll roll away. So there's some difficulties with that application in it, and that's the reason why it's chopped. In terms of the animal actually eating it, there's no requirement for it to be chopped. It's just a practical logistical thing for it to be chopped to stop it moving around. Okay, great. Uh, next question is, what is the best method of sowing a fodder beet crop and is it viable on any soil type? <clears throat> well, again, that's a uh, that, that could be a very long answer there because there's uh, there's a lot involved in that. Um, I'd say this: it's a very flexible crop, so it can grow in a very large uh, range of soil environments. But there are some things that it requires. There's a there's a fertility that has to be supplied. It's reasonably sensitive to pH. It's certainly sensitive to water logging, and there's soils that are better and worse for it to grow in. On top of that. If you're going to graze it, which is always our preference, you have to be very careful about your site selection because some of the wetter areas just really, they'll grow very good crops, but they're not suitable for grazing. With high stocking rates with heavy animals, it's tricky. I'll add one other thing that um, because it's such a high yielding crop, it's a cheap feed source. And so you have to be careful uh, that there's, there's various initiatives that have occurred in New Zealand over the years where people have looked to reduce costs by removing a hundred dollars here or a hundred dollars there and and it, it always ends up being false economy. The, the best way to do beet is to do it properly, to grow the maximum crop you can because a big crop will always be a cheap crop and a bad crop will always be an expensive crop. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm just looking, we've got a lot of questions, so I'm going to try and get us through as many as we, we can. Um, so the next question was, have you seen increased ewe tooth loss in New Zealand when grazing <coughs> used for a series of winters? No, um, and no, it's a, it's a myth. There's two things that come into play with that. One of them is, going back to what I said before, you do have to be reasonably careful in those circumstances that your copper status in those ewes is appropriate, because if it isn't on occasion, that tooth loss can be associated with it. But assuming that it is, um, you, and, and it doesn't, it, it really, it's independent of the dry matter in the type. You don't have more tooth wear on beet when they're chipping away with their incisors than you do in a conventional diet. Um, it was something that, uh, was nosed around in the early days. Originally it was saying that it was tearing teeth out and then it's morphed in recent times into this idea that you've got sand or soil particles that are sort of sand papering the teeth away and neither of them are true. In a number of circumstances we've got uh, dairy herds in particular where there's um, very old cows that have remained in the herd, in some of these cases 12 and 13 years and they've been on fodder beat, long periods of fodder beat every year of their life. Now in these circumstances, there's no there's no change in their mouths. So it's a myth. Okay. Uh, um, when you say about transitioning cattle into beet, in practical terms, yeah. would you feed ab lib hay and restricted beet and gradually increasing access, access to beet over 14 days? What would be the, the main way of transitioning? So um, I was going to return to this in question, so I'm glad that you've asked it. What what we try and do with cattle is with the, we, if we pick the older cattle, the 440 kilo sort of steers or 400 kilo heifers, what we try and do is we restrict over that 14 days their starting allocation from about one kilogram of dry matter to begin with. And then once they're all eating one kilogram of dry matter, we then lift one kilogram of dry matter every second day. And then if you follow that through by the end of approximately 14 days, they'll effectively be eating as much as they can. They'll be slightly under it, but by and large, they're eating as much as they can. And one very simple way for the audience to calculate this, in most cases in Britain, in most areas, the crop that you grow um, won't be very, far away from 20 tonnes. That probably will change in the future, but at the moment that's true. It won't be away from 20 tonnes of dry matter. Now, because at the moment, most of those crops are planted at 500 millimetres in rows of 500 millimetres wide, if you've got 20,000 kilograms of dry matter in a hectare, and there's 10,000 square metres in a hectare, what that practically means is that every square metre has two kilograms of dry matter. 
So it's a relatively straightforward way. If you work on that as a rule, if you've got every square meter you're allocating to your stock, you're supplying two kilograms of dry matter that they'll eat, then you can work back and you can transition them forward. Um, we have some papers that were published on sheep and beef and uh, give uh, strong detail on transition, which I'll uh, supply to you and perhaps you can supply them on to your audience as well. Okay, that'd be great, thank you. Um, so the next question is, are the ME values quoted typical for the periods when the leaf is present and how do the values change as the leaf dies? Do you need to introduce silage <clears throat> for spring carving suckler cow to provide protein? Yeah, so it, the, the answer to the first one is, uh, as a as a general rule of thumb, the ME of the leaf is slightly under 12, and as a general rule of thumb, the ME of the bulb is slightly over 12. Now, the ME of the bulb doesn't change at all. The ME of the leaf only really changes if you've got um, strongly senesced leaf where it ends up on the ground. So there there isn't a, a very strong change in that because that leaf doesn't uh, have a lot of lignification and change over that period. It's 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 not the same as pastures, for example, where that ME declines as it senesces. So uh, to answer that question, as uh, as a, a very dependable rule, it doesn't really matter the leaf content and it doesn't really matter the leaf quality. If you work on 12 ME for that crop in front of you, you'll never be far away. It'll budget for you well and it'll line up with your live weight gains or your body condition score gains very well. Now the second part of that, yep, sorry. No, it's okay, sorry. Yep, so um, can you just repeat the second part of that question again? The second part was, sorry, just bear with me, was do you need to introduce silage for spring carving suckler cows to provide protein? No, the short answer is no. Um, if you're using it as a supplement uh, in spring, so carving on it has its challenges and, and it's worth getting some uh, expert advice around that though we do it and it can be done and it can be done very well but in most cases uh, for the spring carving then it'll be used in lactation with the rest of the diet being a pasture base for example and in those cases you have excess protein you don't have to supply any other protein with it if you're using it with a pasture based diet and nothing else you'll have excess protein if you're using it in spring carving with a mix um, Typically, that's a little different than the dry cow or non-lactating cow use. And go back to what we said before, we would typically limit that to about a third of the diet. In beef cows, you can move that a little bit, but in dairy cows, it's a pretty firm use. But no, you don't have to supply the silage for any protein. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, so I've just got lots of questions and I, I'm conscious of time. So I'm gonna squeeze a couple more in if that's okay with you. Uh, so yeah, the next fine. one is, when should the four applications of nitrogen be applied? So if, if I reverse the hemispheres, and I've been asked this question uh, a bit over the past period, if I reverse it, our nitrogen applications are effectively in quarters. So at the base application, it would be slightly more than 25%, often say 30%. And then the next one would go on in your July, then the following one in late-ish August, and then the, the uh, final of these applications goes on quite late, which is towards the end of September and sometimes even early October. So it's a it's a very late final application and somewhere between 30 and 50 units of N. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we've got a couple of questions on sheep. So uh, why can't lambs be finished on fodder beet without, or without other supplementary feeding such as grain, silage or concentrate? Uh, if I understand the question right, it's saying uh, wh why, why can't they be finished on fodder beet and without With putting anything else in them. Yeah, the, when we did that specific research um, many years ago now, the, the difficulty was to supply to supply the amount of protein that's required uh, for them to ha express their full live weight gain with a beet system. So when they were having leaf and bulb as they normally would in a grazing environment, it began to be a very large amount. So for example, it worked out approximately 50% of um, loosened silage 
uh, to provide the right amount of protein is a very difficult logistical um, exercise to do. Their, their protein requirement is so high that it's very difficult to give them some form of protein that they can make that up while they're making the most of the energy in the beet. And the only practical way that that can be done is around protein concentrates, which typically are very expensive. So it's not necessarily cost effective to do it. Theoretically, it's possible and you can use it, but it's not cost effective most of the time to do it. So they're, they're, the short answer is that their protein requirements are just too high. Okay. And it's okay to feed harvested fodder beet with, without the leaf to use lambs, uh, to you lambs and hoggets? It's a difficult one. Um, you have to be extremely conscious on what the total crude protein of the diet is because without, uh, they, it has uh, very low protein, it typically has extremely low calcium in it and often very low phosphorus which can affect intake as well. And in those cases you're putting uh, quite a lot of material in um, and I didn't uh, address this earlier for, for brevity but one of the difficulties is um, if you look back on what we gave information on the leaf you can see that even though the leaf has a strong protein content and very high calcium content often <clears throat> it's got a relatively low fiber content when you're replacing the protein with other forages in particular it's very difficult to mimic that low ndf and so what you tend to do when you're replacing it with other things is to increase the fiber content of the diet which depresses their intake and particularly in the multiples, you can run into some trouble with that, that they just physically can't eat enough anymore. So yes, the short answer is yes, it can be done. The medium answer on it is that you should do it under advice because it's reasonably tricky to get it right. One okay. practical way though, is that you can feed harvested bulb out onto good pasture. And so you can effectively use it at a 50-50. And in that case, you're really using the beet as a supplement on pasture to extend it. And that works quite well but I think the question was really looking at using harvested beet as a primary diet. Yeah. That's tricky. Okay, and next question, uh, bearing in mind the weather at the moment in this country is, have you done any trials on heavy soil? And do you think the system could cause soil erosion and field runoff? Yeah, we've done, uh, we've done lots of, uh, lo lots of um, operations in New Zealand are in really heavy soil and pretty heavy rainfall and not only there but in a number of places all around the world and there's no question going back to something that I said earlier that some places are just unsuitable for grazing in situ they they really are and I think there's um, there's more and more public attention to some of these places as well and I think you have to be uh, really careful with that and be very careful in your selection in Places where you have heavy cattle and you have high stocking rates, you can, uh, if the site selection is really poor, then you can produce um, uh, a lot of damage to the soil structure. And in those cases, you do get sedimentary runoff and you, uh, you also have some uh, medium term changes to the soil structure itself. So I think you have to be reasonably careful with that selection. Having said that, there's plenty of places in reasonably high rainfall areas that have soils that are drained well enough that even if there might be a day or so where it's pretty poor in the, uh, in the, the broader view, that grazing can be achieved on them without too much trouble. And we don't suffer uh, soil structure difficulties in those environments at all. In fact, we've been using them for many, many years and the yields remain high. Okay, great. Uh, one more question is, is it feasible to outwinter uh, UK autumn calving beef suckler cows with calves at foot on fodder beet? And are there any special considerations? Well, that could be, the, the short answer is yes it is. Um, the medium answer again is that, um, that there should be some expert advice that's uh, achieved before you do that. Um, you can certainly uh, graze beet without any difficulty with calves at foot. There are some considerations around what that diet is, in, in particularly in terms of the supplement that's used at the time and the type of soil that's required to do that well and the structure of your paddock. What, and by that, what I mean specifically is you typically have to have a larger area or a runoff behind it to achieve the, um, to the results that you need. They're much more susceptible at that point to lighter and shyer animals uh, being pushed off the crop and you get uh, extremely variable results in those cases. So it's one of those situations where you do need some 
uh, quite specific uh, advice in them. But in principle, the idea is quite similar. There's a slightly higher supplement input ratio for them, but the principles are, are much the same as we've described before for, um, for dry cow wintering as well. Okay, uh, next question. Will fodder beet have adequate meta there. <laughs> metabolizable protein for 70 kilo twin bearing ewes? Yes, in fact we um, have a have a research work at the moment that's uh, uh, about to be published in this area and the metabolizable protein requirement for multiples in uh, 60 and 70 kilogram use is exceeded by the use of ad lib fodder beet on the assumption that it's an agronomically responsible crop again. So if there's no leaf, you can run into some trouble, but if it's a, a well-grown crop and it's got the adequate leaf for it, then you exceed the metabolizable protein requirements. Okay. It's a good question, and I'm glad that somebody has brought that up because it's a, at the moment there's a little bit of chatter around that, and it's a common myth that your protein requirements can't be met on that. They can that your feeding and the uh, responsible crop agronomy that's required to do that becomes really important. And um, there's some irresponsible talk around that at the moment. Okay, uh, and this is a question from James. I'm gonna mention his name because it was at uh, the event on Monday, you mentioned wobbling cattle during transition and it will knock daily live weight gain for the rest of the winter. What are the yeah. ways cattle can wobble and what are the best ways to avoid this happening? So uh, wobble is a New Zealand term for when they've got mild and subclinical acidosis and what, what will happen, the reason that, it's, that uh, they call it wobbling is because one of the very practical things that you see immediately is a low blood calcium and so they, they tend to show some of the early signs of milk fever even though they might be a steer or a young steer, they show some of the early signs of milk fever and they look a little drunken for a day or so. And in those cases, what the difficulty that you have is that um, their, their memory for the feed is really strong. So functionally, what you've done is you've taught them not to eat a lot of fodder beet. Now in beef systems, you make your money by maximum fodder beet gains. So our saying for them is we try and make every day a happy day. We don't want them to have those negative experiences because you usually don't get them back for the rest of the season. And the way to get around that is to have responsible transition protocols. And the, the protocols really are in uh, knowing what you're feeding. So we mentioned before some simple ways that you can use square meters or even rows as a way of allocating an amount of dry matter and being really careful with those animals to make sure that at the initial allocation, which is low, you know, typically one kilogram of dry matter per animal a day, that you don't move off that allocation until you're confident that all the animals are eating the bulb. They all eat the leaf and so you can be confused on that, but you have to be very confident that they're all eating the bulb. Now, once they're all eating, and that, that is a process of learning and adaptation for them that can take a couple of days, but once they're all eating, you normally can start moving up then, assuming that you've got the adequate space for them, you're not pushing any of the shy or young ones out, um, they, you normally can move up in your allocation without any difficulty at all. So the, the answer to avoiding wobbling stock is to have really positive um, transition protocols. Um, I'll just add this caution. Um, there's some terrible information on the web. <laughs> there's some really poor information on the web these days around uh, transition. And usually it'll go something like this, that you can run them on for 20 minutes and you can run them off and put them on for 40 minutes and you're increasing the time every day. It's a terrible idea. And particularly in beef, it almost always ends up in people losing money. Um, some of the other ones are about filling them up with supplement before they go on. Um, that's often a terrible idea at the initial allocation for it because when they're full, there's no inclination for them to learn to eat a new feed. So what happens is a small number of them begin to eat it all. So there's various, there's some, some very poor advice out on the web, but there are some, uh, there, there, there's some tried and trusted uh, methods of going about this with good protocols and they solve the problem. Okay, so I'm gonna just cut it down now to, to two more questions. Uh, so the first one is, can you direct drill? And what is the drilling depth? Mm -hmm. um, we've had a lot of experience with direct drilling in New Zealand for many, many years now and, and typically there's two scenarios that people would approach it. The first one was what we mentioned before, that people are looking to reduce costs because the, the, the classic 
uh, cultivation and precision drilling is seen as an additional expense and people are interested in reducing the cost per hectare. And wherever we've put that to the test, and we have many times, it's been a dismal failure. Um, it's a false economy most of the time. I mean, fodder beets a valuable crop. And as I mentioned before, the, the, the best way to achieve a really cheap crop is to grow a really big crop. And the best way to achieve a really big crop is to do as you're told, <laughs> to put it bluntly. And um, when people move away from that, uh, usually in our experience with direct drilling, um, because the bulb grows down deep into the ground and the soil hasn't been released for it to do it, it's almost always a five tonne penalty in direct drilling. Now, having said that, the second circumstance where people have approached direct drilling is different, and I have some sympathy for this. There's a number of environments where uh, direct drilling is is favourable because any cultivation in them is either A, extremely difficult, so some very steep uh, country, for example, or B, they've got really thin topsoils with sand underneath, for example, and if they cultivate them, then they're then they're ruined. And in those cases, they're they're not looking to avoid the cost on it, but they're just trying to make the best of a poor situation. Well, again, there's always a yield check, so direct drilling never results in the same crops that you get if you do proper cultivation on it. But it, it's achievable to get crops 20 tons and above. Um, compared to what you can on good soil with other ones, then it never pays. But in those difficult environments, sometimes it's a sensible approach. Okay. And, then, and the depth, I should, should add, he asked, he asked the depth. I'm sorry, our, our typical depth is about 15 millimetres. Okay. And then I think the final question for tonight, because we could be sat here all day, is uh, how do they feed supplements when strip grazing fodder beet for cattle? Would that be big bale silage or other ways? So if it's for beef cattle, did was that question for beef cattle yes, or for dairy? For beef, you just said beef cattle. cattle. Then. Yeah, okay, for beef cattle. So the, the issue with beef cattle, except for suckler cows, is that most cases when you're feeding that, you're feeding for maximum live weight gain. And the beef feeding on beet is the most sophisticated and um, hard charging of all our feeding systems because we want we want that maximum live weight gain and even small increments in live weight gain really pay. So one of the very, very important ways to achieve really high live weight gains on beet after transition is to restrict carefully the amount of supplement that's in the system. So again, there's some terrible information that's been put out there from various sources. And one of them is that um, if you put out uh, bales that you can let the cattle choose the amount of supplement that they'll eat. No, um, what, what they'll do, their harvest cost for eating that supplement uh, from the bale is really low and their harvest cost for eating the beet is uh, high because it's more difficult for them to chip away and they'll take the easier option and they'll always eat more supplement than they need and it collapses their intake and therefore it collapses their live weight gain. So in the most sophisticated systems, what we try and do is have a system where they're grazing uh, one direction, fodder beet in one direction. So for example, if you imagine they're grazing fodder beet north in a paddock and they're grazing uh, some standing forage, often grass, but in very cold weather or very wet weather, it's sometimes standing cereals with a brassica stitched into it, and they're grazing that south. And the advantage of that is that you've got equal access, so you're not pushing some animals away. When you've got large bales going in there, you've, you're relying on um, you know, a relatively high uh, dry matter mass being eaten by a large number of cattle when you can't fit a large number of cattle around a single point source. So the difficulty is you get 30% of them that eat six kilos or all that they want, 30% that never get a sniff at it and some in the middle that get about right. So it, it's usually not a very effective way to do it and it always results in um, an increased supplement use. So the other way to do that effectively if you're feeding supplements out and, and you can is that you can put out a large number of bale feeders but you wire them off and you only allow them access to it for 40 minutes or so a day which is about what it takes for them to eat a couple of kilos. So you can put them in the large bales, you can leave them there but you wire it off, you give them that supplement, hunt them onto it in the morning after transition this is, you can hunt them onto it, you give them that period of time, they can spread out and they can all eat enough and then you take them off it. So again, you restrict the amount of supplement that they're eating. But I would caution, uh, I would caution that listener again who's asking that one, um, if you're using bale feeders as a way of putting out the supplement, you have to reset your expectations on live weight gain. It'll always be about 25 or 30% lower. So unless you do it very carefully for it, it's a difficult uh, way to go about it. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much for the presentation and for answering all those questions. And I'm really sorry to those people at home that have I have asked questions that we just haven't got time to, to answer tonight, so I do apologise to those. Uh, just to remind you that the recording of the webinar will be emailed out in the next day or so in case you need to recap on anything heard tonight. Uh, and it will also be made available on the AHDB, Beef and Lamb and Dairy YouTube channels. So just finally, again, to thank everyone uh, for listening and taking part. And of course, a huge thank you to Jim and have a good evening. OK, thank you. Thank you.